When Hitler declared war on the United States on December 11th, the Kriegsmarine's commander of U-boats, Admiral Dönitz, was eager to expand operations to the Western Hemisphere. He saw the entry of the U.S. into the war as a golden opportunity to strike heavy blows in the tonnage war. And he quickly devised plans to launch a devastating campaign that became known as Operation Drumbeat. Dönitz sought Hitler's permission to transfer a dozen long-range Type 9 U-boats from the Mediterranean and launch them against the United States. However, the Führer refused to weaken the German and Italian forces in the Mediterranean, so he only permitted Dönitz to commit six boats to the operation. By December 18, 1941, Dönitz was ready to launch five long-range U-boats for the protracted Atlantic voyage to the U.S. East Coast. One of the six had been withdrawn due to mechanical trouble. The five captains were instructed not to strike ships unless the target weighed more than 10,000 tons until they arrived at their designated patrol region where they would remain on station for two weeks. Dönitz was convinced that the American coastal defenses were fragmented and disorganized and he intended the submarine commanders to employ maximum shock tactics. The five U-boat commanders were to arrive at their respective locations and await Dönitz's final command to launch attacks simultaneously. The Admiral determined that this first wave of U-boats would patrol between the St. Lawrence River in Canada and Cape Hatteras on the North Carolina coast. All of Dönitz's U-boats had arrived on station by the evening of January 14th and Operation Drumbeat began. U-123's commander, Captain Hardigan, boldly maneuvered his U-boat into the outer limits of New York Bay. Hardigan was shocked at what he observed. They simply weren't prepared at all. After all, there was a war going on. I found a coast that was brightly lit. At Coney Island, there was a huge Ferris wheel and merry-go-rounds. I could see it all. Ships were sailing with navigation lights on. All the lighthouses were shining brightly. To me, this was incomprehensible. The sinkings increased quickly. Donitz's gray wolves hunted their prey unobserved and unmolested along the American shore. The initial five U-boats to enter American waters returned to base after destroying 23 ships weighing over 150,000 tons. Hardigan's Hall included eight ships weighing over 50,000 tons. For this, he was given the prestigious Knight's Cross. Back at the U-boat base in Lorient, Hardigan confirmed Dönitz's assessment that the American seas were a good hunting ground and advised that the offensive be stepped up. Dönitz had already deployed additional U-boats and the sinkings continued, but he never had more than a dozen ships in action at once along the American coast. Unbeknownst to Dönitz, the U.S. Naval High Command was not surprised by any of this. The Royal Navy informed the United States that, according to Enigma intelligence decryptions, a large U-boat operation was about to begin, and they should expect a heavy concentration of U-boats off the North American seaboard. On January 12, 1942, the U.S. Naval High Command was informed that the Admiralty Submarine Tracking Unit in London had tracked a large number of U-boats heading for the U.S. East Coast and was about to begin operations against coastal shipping. This was equivalent for all the good it did to trying to save a condemned man by informing him of the length of rope with which the executioner was about to hang him. Admiral Ernest J. King, commander of the United States Fleet and head of naval operations, was responsible for the eastern seaboard's dismal lack of readiness. His subordinate vice, Admiral Andrews, commander of the eastern sea frontier, warned him two months before the slaughter began. Should enemy submarines operate off this coast, this command has no forces available to take adequate action against them. King took no significant action to reduce the threat. Andrews had 20 mostly antiquated ships patrolling the one and a half thousand mile coastline, including tugs, yachts, trawlers, schooners, and motor cruisers manned primarily by enthusiastic amateur sailors. None of the ships could keep up with a U-boat running on the surface. The quaint little fleet was officially known as the Coastal Picket Patrol Force, but due to its ineffectiveness, it was nicknamed the Donald Duck Navy. By January 1942, the U-boat crews had been at war for more than two years and were highly skilled and efficient at sinking ships. When Donitz unleashed his gray wolves on the relatively defenseless U.S. eastern seaboard, the consequences were lethally predictable. 
By the end of February, 327,000 tons of shipping had gone down, with the majority of the sinkings occurring off the eastern seaboard. Dunitz was overjoyed, and he was able to dispatch more ships to take up positions off the coast of the United States and begin expanding into the Caribbean. To avoid detection, U-boats in a combat zone would frequently spend the daylight hours on the ocean floor and hunt at night. However, Hartigan and his fellow captains quickly realized that this was unnecessary because the defenses were non-existent. Towns and cities along the coast refused to impose a blackout for fear of losing tourist trade. From the cold Canadian coast to the tropical Caribbean, the U-boats cruised freely, destroying unaccompanied freighters and tankers with impunity. Their targets were essentially sitting ducks, silhouetted against the brightly lit coastline. The vast majority of the sunk merchants were unarmed, forcing their crews to endure the assault without any means of defense. On February 6th, Winston Churchill, alarmed by the increasing losses in American waters, messaged President Roosevelt requesting that he pay special attention to the crisis. Ships were sunk 30 miles or less offshore, making burning ships a common sight near certain coastal resorts. While the horrific one-sided battle raged on America's doorstep, the public was fed a false narrative. Hardigan stated, we listened to the American radio transmissions and we heard, we have sunk a U-boat. We were supposed to have been sunk three times. Every time we sank a ship, we were sunk again. The Americans obviously needed this as a consolation. The idea that they had done something, but it wasn't true. The slaughter continued in March with the tonnage sunk equaling that of January and February combined. Two months after the start of the offensive, the U.S. Navy hadn't sunk a single Axis submarine. Mussolini dispatched Italian submarines eager to take advantage of what the Germans were calling the American shooting season. Sir Dudley Pound, the British first sea lord, urged Admiral King to implement a convoy system, arguing that the Royal Navy had learned the hard way through bitter experience that patrols were ineffective. The Anglophobic King rejected their advice, believing that ships sailing independently were less vulnerable than when bunched together in convoy without strong escort protection. However, Britain's experience demonstrated that a poorly guarded convoy was preferable to no convoy at all. Dunitz's campaign in the Caribbean was well underway by this point, with a half dozen U-boats and several Italian submarines pillaging with alarming confidence. U-161 entered the harbor at Trinidad's port of Spain and torpedoed and sank two tankers at anchor, while U-156 slipped into Aruba's port torpedoed and shot up three tankers and shelled the oil terminal before departing, demonstrating how unprepared the region's defenses were. On March 17th, the situation became critical when U-124 torpedoed four tankers and a steamer off Cape Hatteras in the course of a single night. It was clear that the Donald Duck Navy could not handle the task of protecting U.S. shipping. Andrews flew to Washington to plead with Admiral King for destroyers, a request he flatly refused. The Navy received numerous complaints from Southern Florida all the way up to Atlantic City that the tourist season was being ruined by tankers burning within sight of sunbathers and the inability to bathe due to oil slick washing up onto the beaches. Shocked by the scale of the losses, Churchill offered Roosevelt 24 armed trawlers and 10 corvettes manned by experienced subhunters, which he gratefully accepted. By the end of May, 129 tankers had been lost in American waters, prompting the Petroleum Industry War Council to issue a warning that unless the situation improved, America would run out of oil in six months. Even so, there were signs that things were improving. By the second week in May, two U-boats had been sunk and the coastal communities had finally been ordered to observe a blackout. The normally partisan official history was damning in its condemnation, stating, one of the most reprehensible failures on our part was the failure of local communities to dim their waterfront lights or of military authorities to require them to do so until three months after the submarine offensive began. Miami and its opulent suburbs cast a six-mile neon-like glare against which shipping was silhouetted. Ships were wrecked and seamen drowned so that the citizens may go about their business and enjoy themselves. As U-boats continued to destroy shipping in the Caribbean and along the American coast, Churchill and the Admiralty closely monitored their movements from London. Concerned about the lack of progress, 
Churchill pressed Roosevelt on the issue and demanded drastic action. He assured the British leader that everything was being done to improve the situation. The Army Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall spoke with King, leaving him in no doubt about the gravity of the situation. The losses by submarines off our Atlantic seaboard and in the Caribbean now threaten our entire war effort. Under pressure, King eventually gave in and implemented an effective convoy system by reallocating resources. Admiral Andrews was able to organize large offshore convoys thanks to the allocation of destroyers and other escort vessels from the U.S. Atlantic Fleet, as well as new construction. The first of the regularly scheduled U.S. coastal convoys departed on May 14th. As the U-boats were deprived of their sitting ducks along the eastern seaboard, Dunitz responded by shifting his wolf pack southward into the Gulf of Mexico, Panama, Salvador, and Rio de Janeiro. Here, the gray wolves found successful hunting grounds, but this only delayed the inevitable, as the convoy system was eventually extended to Rio. In July, the U.S. Navy sank more U-boats than it had in the entire war thus far. It was obvious that what the Kriegsmarine had come to refer to as the second happy time was finally over. Dunitz began transferring his U-boats back to the North Atlantic for a renewed onslaught on Allied convoys heading for Britain. Operation Drumbeat was a victory for Dunitz's Grey Wolves and a disaster for the Allies. During the first half of 1942, more than 360 merchant ships and tankers, totaling well over 2 million gross tons, sank in coastal waters from Canada to the Caribbean. Over 5,000 people died needlessly, the vast majority of whom were merchant seamen. Most of the blame lies with a single, hard-drinking, stubborn admiral. If you like this video, there are many similar high-quality videos on my channel.